everybody, welcome to the Patriot Show. I'm your host, Anthony Stephen Malone. Today we have a very special guest, Colin J. Easterway, veteran of the Pouchet Regiment, One Power Special Forces Group, Section Commander, and now co-founder of Mind Forces Retreat and The Block in Liverpool. Hello, Colin. How are you? Hello, mate. Nice one. Thanks for inviting us on. Lovely to see you. No problems at all, mate. Um, a few of the people who are going to be watching this won't be aware of you or the good work that you do or your your background as a veteran as well. Can you give us a, a very brief overview of your history, please? Yeah, sure. So, uh, hello, everyone. My name's Colin. Uh, I joined the Parachute Regiments in 2001, basically after... Uh, I come from Liverland, Bootle in Liverpool. Wasn't that many opportunities around for me. So um, it was quite starting to get maybe like gang culture, if you like, around Liverpool at that time as well. So I, I felt that maybe, you know, I didn't want to slip into that or didn't want those people around me. So I went off and decided to join my own gang and being in the Paris. And uh, yeah, so I had 10 years there. Um, Obviously, in 2005, we went over into the Special Force Support Group after I'd done, obviously, the Six-Day Assault Brigade operation in 2003. Then we did Northern Ireland in 2005, and then we transitioned over to the group. We went down from, moved from Dover to St. Athens. Uh, a really good time for to be in that regiment. Obviously, that was around about the time when uh, Colonel Mike Jones was doing the uh, amalgamations as well. And I think with him being X1 para, we benefited and we went into the SF group where everybody else, a lot of people lost their, their famous regiments and they got me re renamed, if you like. But yeah, we certainly benefited from it as a regiment and as the British Army as well. Um, it's the special force support group. So that was, yeah, that was, that was a good time to be in the Army, good time to be in the parachute regiment. We got a lot of stick from two and three para, calling Power Rangers and and all, all the other all the other good stuff that was going around. But to be honest with you, yeah, we yeah we done some really good stuff for training. You know, at the start it was <clears throat> maybe it was new new sets of training, and I think first we had to sort of get get I don't know what the, the ready state was as a, as a battalion. You know, like where you work yourself up from platoon level stuff, company level stuff you know, into then battalion level stuff. And then it was also group level stuff. And we had to do that under the direction of obviously SF to, to get ready to then make the transfer. So that was a good, a good time to be in the unit. And then after that, every, everything we done was obviously SF disclosure and SF operations. You know, I done free tours of Afghanistan, numerous other countries and stuff we visited for certain reasons under the group as well. But yeah, it was great. But I decided to leave in 2010. A lot of few more friends were obviously uh, lost in Afghanistan. You know, uh, God bless those people and those fam their families. And uh, a few of my friends were also injured. And then, yeah, I just thought, you know, I remember being in the, uh, remember being in in Afghan on and off in 2010, and we went and collected a load of. Uh, Afghan soldiers, if you like, to then start some training with them. And um, the guy who got off the chopper and handed them over on a government contract for G4S, and even though we was in the army, he was a guy who actually served, actually joined with and done my training with in 2001 as part of Edge, uh, Rob Major. <laughs> and he was like telling us, you know, how much dough they, they, they were on and stuff like that. And I was like, hey, if I'm going to be in this, in, in this, in, in this country, let's get paid for it. So I, I left the forces and went and joined. Uh, yeah, the uh, the CP lads and stuff in Iraq and managed to tick away and pay off all the credit card debts and whatnot, you know. And yeah, so 2010 till 2008 on and off, I was working on the circuit. I've worked in um, obviously in southern Iraq, northern Iraq, Baghdad, Kurdistan, different embassies. I've had uh, stints in the Australian embassy, the New Zealand embassy, the British embassy in Kurdistan. Um, uh, the other two, obviously, in Baghdad. Um, yeah, loads, loads of gas and oil contracts up and down the country, uh, a, lot, a lot around Basra. And yeah, and then in 2018, 
I decided I was not no more for me. I was sick of living in containers and living that life. And I come home and um, just concentrated on my executive CP work, um, private security. I be said I'd been working on. I'm actually managed to find a good balance uh, before the pandemic hit. Obviously, with um, working in hostile in the winter when it was a bit cooler out in the desert <laughs> and in Iraq, and then I was coming home and. Um, I'm going to IB for I was using the money to pay for my place in the beef and build this excellent client base up and find this really good balance. Then I let the hostile stuff go, just concentrated on my, my executive clients. Done a lot of uh, Villa RST, high value clientele, if you like, and then working closely with the families who who travel either into the country for one week, two weeks, working with them because you build obviously your rapport up and they come back year after year. You get to know the clients and how they like their security delivered. Well, got a slight technical problem. Um, Colin's back. Yeah, so I was obviously building up a really good uh, uh, rapport with clients, you know, and it was all, all working very well. That, that, that's what I was doing. Obviously, then post, uh, post uh, sorry, the pandemic hit, and um, just get my words out there. The pandemic that we all we all experienced at the moment hit us, and yeah, you know, no fly to a beefer fair and. Fortunately, all my work was in the hospitality industry. So, yeah, I found us a bit of a shock last year, <clears throat> as, as we all did, you know, and then you sort of left with seeing what was around in the UK, jumping on. But luckily, luckily, I uh, had a really great client that I had in the BFA, and he gave me, he offered me a great opportunity to be the country manager for logistics security that I'm doing now. Um, yeah, so the first time I've been employed by a client since leaving the army, I've always done my own stuff, but... I'm really loving it, you know. Uh, it's a different, different dynamics, different, uh, different areas that I'm working in, but I'm learning a lot, you know, and working with, with different types of security guards, uh, and it's great security for myself being employed by such a great company, the brilliant, brilliant company to work for. So made up with that. Uh, pandemic has obviously hit lockdown now. So uh, here I am now sitting in, in this project that I'm working on called uh, The Block. Um, and uh, this is basically two shops and eight flats converted into a veterans drop-in centre, mate, where we're basically helping local guys out in Liverpool and, and yeah. uh, connect, doing our best to connect with other charity organisations, veteran organisations that are around here, uh, and just helping guys out with their mental health, general employment, housing, and also having a place that we can form a good group and a community and you know, maybe even deliver outreach and moving further down the line when, when we, we get a bit of backing and a bit of support, you know what I mean? Yeah, mate. Um, on, on that one, be, because you've, you're, you're obviously a veteran, you've been there, seen it, you've got the T-shirt, your transition from the military into civilian street, where you went into the PMC world, which is very similar kind of environment to the military. Can you speak a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. Like, I talk about that a lot. Uh, and um, it's with me. I mean, I, I, I was due to get out last 12 months of being in the group and then got this job offer from Olive Group. And it was like, uh, you know, military, it's going into the private security sector, as you just mentioned, put it down in front of the CEO. Can I kind of leave a few months early? Yeah, got a job, off you pop. You know, you're dead wood at that stage in the battalion. I was acting as, I was acting as like... Um, what's it called, the Provo Sergeant, you know, I was reporting to the RSM and telling people to get off the grass and stuff like that, shouting my voice across the place, which was funny, it was good, you know, picking people up with the sideies and all that, but, but you know, it's not what you're doing the army for, is it? And that's the position you get in when you're dead wood. I was taking up a bed space of a fighting soldier, you know what I mean? So, so I left and I went off, they were happy for me to leave early. And, and I went and uh, jumped on, on, on the private security industry there. You know, that night, 12 o'clock the next night, after signing the paperwork, I was on a flight to, to Basra. No transition, as you quite mentioned. Yeah. I never experienced Civvy Street. I wasn't a Civvy, I was a paratrooper. You know, I rocked up and I'm still with the same mindset, but I'm straight in there, you know. I was like site security manager for the rig and doing the PSC moves to from the airport to, to the rigs with the American clients and the Canadian clients on a contract called the Weather for Contract at the time. And it was their job to then go and find all the old wells, the old wellheads which Saddam had like covered over and put a light to. And they were digging them back up. 
we were obviously escorting them to it. We were using our map reading skills to find these old wellheads, and they were obviously refurbing them and putting the new, the new Christmas tea tree type uh, well taps at the top. You know, so yeah, no no transition at all, really. Uh, you go, you land there, and it was it was it was like 90 percent heavy with ex pirate edge and raw marines. You know, anyway. And a, a lot of lads who have come from Baghdad on the ages contract. So it was a very still a warry group, you know, and like a mili military military community that you're in. And then a couple of years of that, um, yeah, that was when I realised I didn't really want to stay there. I wanted to try and give Civvy, Civvy Street a go, uh, but I wanted to stay in the security sector. I didn't want to work in London too much. I didn't like the idea of clients telling me, oh, what, what time are we there? How many minutes? And all that, you know, it was just not really for me. So I tried to mix business with pleasure and look towards the Ibiza side of things with a, a high-end clientele, high profile, high net worth. Because I, I loved the music industry at the time. You know, I loved the whole thing, the rock star lifestyle and stuff. And I thought, let's try and mix business with pleasure here. You know, you know, this could be perfect if you can get a bodyguard job in Ibiza. That's what I thought at the time. But you quickly realise in that industry, you cannot mix business with pleasure. You know, shit bust, you cannot, you can't mix the two, it's one or the other. Uh, but for me, it become business like strictly, you know, and it was good. I made it as my sole income, dropped the um, drop, drop the CP work, you know, uh, in, in the summers for the whole six months. People thought it was crazy because I was forever resigning off contracts after going on them for four to six months, you know, high paid salaries when there's visa problems. I had visas, but I was still like, see, yeah, I just didn't want to be there. I wanted to get the bit of cash. To bounce on to do what I was doing, I always had that ex exit plan, you know. Good, yeah. It's important that quite a lot of the guys do not have an an, an exit plan, so they end up they end up working in like Iraq, Afghan, throughout Africa, and it's all right earning good money, but there comes a time where you need to think, what am I going to do next? How am I getting out of this? Because when you're getting paid, all your cars are cold, you're not. When you're getting paid good money, there's a reason why you're getting paid it. And it's all right working in environments at a high risk. But if you push it too much and work over an extended period of time, you're going to end up picking up an injury or being involved in more than one contact. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. So when you, when you move from, obviously, the military into the PMC world, then you made the break from PMC into doing high net close protection in Ibiza. You seem to have done that quite seamlessly. You moved from one to the other. How, how did you find that? I think for myself, I, I, you're right in what you're saying. Um, a, a lot of operators, they tend to either have a lot of hostile experience or little or no hostile experience and executive side of things. And they, they are two different uh, type of operator. Yeah. Um, different, different breeds, different, different approach to, to the role completely, actually. And the the ones who are got a lot of hostile experience, they're not always best suited to working with high profile clientele or high net worth clientele because they have a particular set of way of doing things. Generally, you know, it's high risk. So you get, yeah, you've got your actions on, you've got your drills, you know, your weapon skills, your team leading, and it's like, boom, it's how you do it, you know. And a lot of the time you get paid to be there. You get paid to do, to, you know, for, because of what you can do, not because of what you're actually doing. <laughs> you know, for yeah. sitting there tooled up and being an armored taxi driver, if you like, and being ready and, like I say, knowing your actions on, where in the, this executive CP world, your high profile world, um, yeah, your your high net worth world. You get paid for your more obviously the skills that you know. Yes, but the, what you bring to the table as well. You know, uh, a lot more attention to detail. I think definitely, and almost a lot more personal assistance. You know, uh, building relationships with the clients, but professional relationships, whether that be a relationship with their children. You know, different people in the family, different obviously know, knowing their role and knowing your position. It's not it's not a, a one size fits all role, you know. And that's why you that's why the beauty of me having the clients in Ibiza, they know me and I know them. Yeah. You know, I know how they like their these type of clients all like their security delivered in a different way. You've got to you've got to get it right, otherwise the client won't like you. You know, I could be on with one client one day who likes their, you know, on their shoulder. 
type celebrity style, you know, BG. And then I get another one who likes me sitting back at the bar, overwatching everything and watching for the head movements. And, and I'm, I'm there, but I'm not there, you know? And it, it, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think, well, to answer your question, how, how I managed it was, I think because I like the industry so well, so much, the uh, be fair, the high net worth. I love the island, had a passion for the island. Because I've got that passion for the island I was, and even the music industry, I was able to share it both with the clients and then deliver my expertise more as a personal assistant role, concierge. And I've had a lot of people who have no more background have said, oh, Colin, you're the facilitator, or you know, you're the concierge. I've been like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll just roll with that. I don't need to tell them, you know, oh, I, I was ex this and I've done this course and got these calls and all that. That's fine. The client knows, knows that. He knows them. First stage, you know, hands on. He knows about it. They got plans when things go wrong. Like, I don't need to tell the Joe public that. It's actually a compliment if somebody says to me, or if they say, "Oh, do you work for the bar or the club?" I'm like, "No, I don't. I'm just with the client." You know, and it's about getting the balance, isn't it? Oh hell yeah, you've yeah you've got that. I think the protocol protocol is so important in the industry in the CP world as well. Just because you're good at fighting on a battlefield doesn't mean you're going to be good at being able to talk to or blend in. You are what I would class as a grey man, which is great because you can blend in with all the corporates in any any location and you don't look like what you are. You know what you're qualified in. Your client knows your capabilities, which are incredible, but the public won't know. So that's actually a compliment. If they're coming up to you saying, are you the concierge? They have no idea what you're yeah. capable of. I mean, so I think corporate clients, some of them want to be seen with the big seven foot goom pillars. The majority of the corporates do not want that. They want someone who can blend in more as a personal assistant. But if the need arises, you can step straight in and deal with any problem there for them and the families with the children as, as well. So I think you're absolutely right in what you've just said there, Carl. The protocol of an officer is so important. Being able to fight is one little, little part of it. Uh, being able to communicate and blend into all the environments, that is very important. One of the other things that you're very passionate about as well um, is be safer. And you brought that about, haven't you, in Liverpool? Yeah, exactly. And it, that, to be honest, that sort of be safe in is um, uh, a company that I set up a couple of years ago. Um, it's be safe in knife detectors. So the aim was basically to buy the assets, being the knife archers, the walkthrough metal detectors, and offering it out in a collaboration way to existing security companies or to event project managers themselves and say to them, you know, we can, we can assist you. You know, bring in, when somebody asks for, you know, 20 security guards that's easy to deliver but i think be safer delivers a little bit more we'll go in and we'll do the risk assessments so and we'll also help with the plan and the event management and then provide the specialist equipment uh whether it be standalone equipment or with the team as, as well to basically uh, provide access control in line with um obviously the new laws that could potentially be coming up in the next couple of years uh with being the airport style check and security on the major events, which you already see. I think Tottenham Hotspur do it in their football stadium. No, now you now we're in pandemic. When we when we open up, the, people will start seeing these around more. So that was that comes inside with my passion again for for like you know the festivals, the music industry, people going out and enjoying themselves. And me, I like to go out and enjoy myself. Summertime festival. Go, you can go to a nightclub, but I don't like going to a nightclub where I would find the security laxy daisy. And then you see gangs in there and you're thinking, if this goes off in here, like, you know, what is everyone carrying? You just don't know. So I always find myself standing back against the wall and wouldn't really enjoy my night because I'm too busy eyeballing everybody. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, let's get off out of here. I don't like the vibe, you know? But then I found that when you go more places like IB for where you don't get the gang culture and the vibes and stuff like it. It's everyone's just there having a nice time and it's lovely. Or even in the UK where people, you have gone through a, a strict uh, check control going through and you know nobody in there is carrying any fer uh, ferocious weapons. 
you're like, oh, you can relax more and enjoy, you know, whether that be a family event or an adult event, it doesn't matter as long as the, the place is secure. So my passion was literally to, to, to offer this, obviously, security passion as well. And I was thinking it of a business perspective. But I thought I had this idea to do a few years ago, but didn't actually have the money. But then I had a good season. I'd be to come home and I invested into all the knife archers and I got, got, you know, got the van and started doing it, marketing it and started connecting well with event managers who I already knew. And yeah, so be safe. And it's now be safe for security solutions. So because yeah. uh, I've took this role on now, obviously it's got it's got a new director, but I'm still in the background. We're working on it. I'm still having regular meetings obviously not for profit meetings with organizations in Liverpool who are planning knife crime prevention, you know, strategies. Again, it's big, you know, knives are, knives are a coward's weapon on the street. You know, when I was growing up, people didn't carry them, but now it's like everyone carries a knife and like, it does what they threaten you with. And it's like, it's yeah. a coward's trick and it ruins, it ruins the nightlife. It ruins festivals. It ruins lives, you know, it ruins families. Like, you know what I mean? So I've started working with, um, with the, the organization, real men don't carry knives. You know, I, I've offered them my assets for free. You know, we've worked with schools and stuff, gone in, get to deliver presentations. And I just go in and deliver it as me, as an individual. I'm just calling from Google. Like I've been in the army and, you know, and tell them if you get a criminal record for carrying a knife, like it's, you know, it, it's going to ruin your life. Like, even if you don't even stab anybody, just because you get nicked with it, like, you know? Yeah. Well, the the work you're doing there with the with helping to reduce the knife crime at, at events, life festivals, and at, and and in schools and things like that, incredible. If people want to find out more inf information about be safe, have you got a page? Have you got a website? Yeah, the website's there, mate. Be safe at knifedetectors.co.uk. You can jump on. It's on Instagram as well under Be Safe. Uh, and uh, Facebook, be safer, and uh, or, or also check out the great work that Alan's doing over at Real Men Don't Carry Knives. He's in Older Hay Hospital uh, every day, every morning, working with the kids down at ground level, uh, early intervention, which is vital. He's been doing that right the way through the pandemic. That's Real Men Don't Carry Knives, yeah, brilliant stuff. Awesome. So if anyone, any of my viewers are watching that, I would recommend get on there, have a look at it very very good if you're watching this and you host outside events and want more information speak to colin di directly his details are on the website as well um on that one colin coming back to mind forces retreat and the work you've been doing putting it all together building it from scratch can you tell me viewers a little bit about that please I can, yeah, I can. Uh, I am passionate about this, but I'm not precious with it, and it's about sharing it. Um, so thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. Now, um, you know, last year, the pandemic, again, everybody really stressed, including me, you know, financially. Uh, I would like to say it was, it was, it was almost a disaster. You know, everything I'd work for, the Abifa, you know, and all these businesses, events, history, uh, hospitality sector down, no income. You know, self-employed, financially, it was a mess. Was I going to explode? No. Why? The only one reason is because I managed to get my head in a good place and I used my own mind to just basically feel free. Even though financially, I couldn't afford to pay, you know, my mortgage, my car, my bills, electric. I hadn't worked for nine months. This was like, you know, a disaster here. Like, yeah. but I just had this uh, crawl back moment pulled out the cigar, I don't smoke, but I pull one out and I give it, you know, I, how, how am I going to get through this? What's my next move? You know what I mean? And I just managed to get my head in a good place. And I thought, like, so I decided, well, if I, I was obviously connecting with a lot of different veteran organisations, as you do on Facebook, you know, you, you Charlie, Charlie, one all call signs, pages, you see the amount of lads struggling, you know, and then you're getting on the phone with them and boys that I know personally that are not sharing stuff on Facebook and then, you know, your next minute you're hearing the people taking their own lives and stuff like that, you know, and it was, it was like, I was like, wow. So I thought, what if I can create something like a space where and try and give them the tools that I've just used to put my mind in a good place when the world is falling down around them, they can just sort of get their mind in a good place and, 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 and you know, and deal with it. But also because the industry that I worked in, that I work in, I should say, the security industry, 
uh, and I've always worked abroad and stuff. And when you when you when you do go on this sector, G4S, for example, I haven't worked for them recently, but I've applied for jobs, you know, a few years ago, G4S, and I've worked for CRG, I've worked for Garda World, I've worked for Edinburgh International, I've worked for Garda Welsh Olive Group, you know, um, a few the few of us, and they send you the form, and they're like, "How's your mental health?" You know, have you been depressed in the last six months? You no. Know, uh, have you had, you know, uh, anxiety in the last six you know, Have you ever, you know, mental health? You no. Know, doctor, GP, you no. Know, headaches? You're like, no. Like, come on. Like, who hasn't had a headache? Do you know what I mean? In the last six months. Who hasn't felt depressed in the last six months or had anxiety or had low, low mental health? But if you tick yes on those forms, because I was in the security industry, it's all part of like the stigma connected to it. You can't have low mental health. Otherwise, they won't take you out on the ground. They wouldn't, wouldn't take, I, 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 that's what I'm pursuing. I never, ever take no, to be honest with you. Do you know what I mean? Times when I've been, when I have been low, and I just, I've always steered away from it. Now, I'm not saying that if you ask, if you, I will say this, if you are struggling, get help, like, you know, but there was times when I've refused it in the past. And I've, I've, I've always gone on that holistic therapy route. And then I found like solace and peace within myself through the holistic therapy route. It did work for me. Like, and I, I do do my own holistic therapy every day. I do a bit of guided meditation and breath work and it helps me, you know, and I'm, I consider myself, I'm, I'm great. Like I'm flying. I've got a good job, you know, and I'm happy. Like this main thing, my head's in a good, good, good space. So it worked for me. So I just want to introduce my own experiences for people who were either in my shoes or people that had maybe been around the whole sector. I was speaking to a lot of guys who have been on combat stress and then walked off combat stress or also refused combat stress when the pandemic hit because they stopped the funding or the veterans had used the words that they were too complex for combat stress and they'd sent them away to go and seek additional help to get themselves ready before they can go on combat stress. And I'm like, wow, and obviously I'd never reached out to combat stress or I've never been diagnosed with it myself. So I can't, I don't know, I'm just repeating what they say to me. So I was like, well, what if they do refuse you? Or what if they're, you know, where do you go from there? So I was like, well, there needs to be another pathway. So yeah, I thought, well, I want to create this Mind Force Retreat. And originally I, thought I was sitting in IB for the pandemic, it wasn't working. My head was obviously in such a good place, space, mentally, physically. Uh, I created this Mind Force Retreat. I rented a big villa in IB um, There was actually a mansion. It was the place where one of the famous footballers apparently had a stag do and all this. It was, it was amazing. I had it all set up. I was going to introduce over the space of a week, guided meditation, yoga, you know, uh, Reiki, you know, just different forms of holistic therapies, all structured, like, and then go on water therapy. I had wind, wind uh, surfing set up over on the little islands. This was an amazing week, like, that was planned out. I managed to get numerous different funders involved. I was taking a lot of inspiration for what the Americans do in the States, like, you know, and um, I couldn't really find much inspiration from the UK, to be honest with you, in this, this type of, of practice. But I was taking all the inspiration from them and my own inspiration as well, putting it together, created it, started that marketing it, which every, marketing it, which everybody's seen. Different veteran organisations were buying into it. We're going to sponsor veterans. I was taking the veterans from other charity networks, other groups that were basically being referred to us through their own networks. And... Yeah, and I was going to deliver it, but then the two-week quarantine rule hit, and it was like, it just went on and on and on, and I couldn't do it yeah. in Ibiza. So we flew back to uh, flew back to the UK early, where I normally fly back around October, and come back in August, made the decision, things weren't looking the best there, made the decision, come home, pandemic, and focus on the Mind Force Retreat. We then took the same 10 veterans that we had, and we delivered the same concept in... Formby Hall in, in, in Merseyside, uh, South Portway. Lovely, lovely place. Great four-star spa, golf resort. All the footballers go there. All the mothers go there on Mother's Day. So I'm like, well, it's good enough for them. It's good enough for veterans, do you know what I mean? They're a bit stressed out like. Or, But I didn't use the word uh, uh, complex PTSD. I just used the words stress, anxiety, depression yeah. and burnout. If you're struggling with stress, which is everybody, <laughs> if you're struggling with um, 
anxiety, which is a lot of people as well through the pandemic, depression or burnout, then this could be for you, come down. And it was totally non-clinical sessions in non-judgmental, like-minded groups and sessions. And uh, wow, the impact was amazing. Yeah. Uh, like I say, people were getting referred to us from numerous different charities. People were, people's mothers were referring um, guys to us or people's wives. And I was like, you know, they were getting in touch with me. In the end, I had 10 really amazing people who had all suffered with something or, or actually suffering with, at the moment, still, still serving, couldn't access the therapies or didn't want to access the therapies uh, because of the macho environment they were working in stigmatic still today in the army or in the marines and the navy and the air force didn't want to access it reached out to us we gave them it and then they went back and it obviously it benefited them for some reason yes yeah, some people just don't want to reach out when they're in it when they're in those those fighting units if you like because yeah the macho uh, stigma behind it so mate in a nutshell like i think everybody or well, i know that everybody that attended the retreat took something away from it even myself and you know, all the instructors so powerful so since then, we've been planning the next one. Obviously, the pandemic has, has hit us a bit. Um, so we, we had to push it back a bit. We've got our next retreat already fully booked up on May the 17th. Uh, another group of 10 amazing people there again. And we're going to deliver something almost very the same. Where We're introducing uh, art as therapy this time. We do the equine horse therapy down at Shiloh and the stables there in Neverton. Absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, guided meditation, mindfulness walks, totally non-clinical, like-minded people, non-judgmental. We obviously, we've got the driving range there for a bit of a sports afternoon as well. Just get together, have ging gang you know what I mean? No PowerPoints, no yeah. doctors sitting in the corner of the rooms, just people on different walks of life struggling with different things, but coming there for a bit of respite and relief, you know? It's Colin, what you're doing there is incredible. You're making such an impact. And what people see is the end result. They don't see the amount of work you and your guys are doing behind the scenes here. This is like 24 seven for a long period of time here. So I just want my viewers to understand here. This isn't just something that's been thrown together. Colin and his team have been working every hour, God can send for want of a better word, to get this up and running and the benefits to veterans out there as well. It's making a massive impact as well. A small idea, he's run with it, organised it, got some good people around him, and it's, it is helping veterans out there. Colin, on a serious note, if any veterans are out there going through a hard time at the moment, because there's a lot of guys who are struggling at, at the moment, do you have yeah. a message for them as well? Yeah, okay, so this is how I see it, like, obviously I'm a veteran, I'm not a therapist, mate, you know what I mean, I'm not a mental health worker or anything like that, I'm a, I'm a bloke who just has got a passion now for helping veterans and a passion for, uh, you know, introducing different therapies, in a way, I've actually got a bit of a passion for, like, uh, for, for, for helping blokes to reach out for the first time and stuff as well, because I know that the services are out there, are now working, like, you know, and they are, and the government's I say the government are pumping millions into these, you know, the NHS veterans, TILS, the transition invention, and intervention liaison. You know, this is a special um, organization that's been set up within the NHS. They've pumped millions into it. They've now got like uh, mental health nurses who are like ex Navy, ex Army, ex RAF, if you like all working there so nine times out of ten when you ring them it's someone that understands like they like mind that they get it you know you're not speaking to a civvy half the time and they've set this up specially because they know that we are a particular breed you know what i mean and they've set it up for us they've just put like another 10 million into it in the last announcement that that's there for us so my message if you are struggling reach out to that go to that start at the top i had a, a chap last night who reached out to us and and I'm not here selling the Mind Force Retreat and telling them, telling these people, this is what you want to do. You want to come on the. No. You, what you want to do is you want to go to the NHS, the TILS, the inter trans transition liaison intervention, speak with them and get guidance from them. Yeah. They have now even started signposting veterans to the Mind Force Retreat, but you need to be ready 
for the Mind Force Retreat. You need to be the right person for the Mind Force Retreat, and the mic, the right, the, the Mind Force Retreat needs to be right for you as well. But it's a, to be able to have the effect and you know the, the desired effect, if you like. But if you're struggling, go to the NHS. You'll find you'll if you go on the Mind Force Retreat page, you'll see it at the top transition liaison get guidance from them get the help that you need and the money that's in there it's from the government this is the money that this is what what we all say oh you know the help's not there it is you need to ask for it you need to go for it they're not going to come knocking on your door and, and give you it you've got to go through the system and you've got to go through it the right way you know me so the bit they called it now up courage it speaks for itself have a bit of courage yeah and get on the up Go and speak with them. I swear down, like that money there is uh, it's ours. It's what we've all been shouting for for the over the years, and now now it's there. So we need to utilise it. This money as it's not charity. You know, the NHS are working with numerous different charities. Most of the charities now we've got money in the pots. It's government money. Yeah. It's our money. Veterans. It's not Joe Publix put into the account, put into into the bucket, so they all pension their charity. That's not what you're doing here. You're taking money, the government's putting into it, and it's it's for us, it's ours. Therapy's not a dirty word, like neither, neither is PTSD, you know. Yeah. Colin, that is great advice out there. Absolutely outstanding, as always. Message to vets out there. If you're going through a hard time, don't stay in your flat or your house by yourself. Reach out to somebody. Also, if you are going through an hard time, get your boots, trainers on, get your jacket on, go out for a walk in the countryside, in the local park. You'll feel better for it as well. Um, Colk, can you speak a little bit about getting people out and getting some exercise? Yeah, of course. You know, uh, this all, all comes inside with, with the project, the Mind Force Retreat. It's the basics that we, we, we forget and we don't do, you know. Self-care, um, you know, I should practice more what I preach. Like, you know, I've had a busy day this morning, so I'll probably, after this, I'll cut away and I'll go and do some self-care. I'll go and relax, you know. I'll go and have, have a... I'll switch off my phones for a bit, you know, just concentrate on the breathing, you know, do maybe, I don't know, maybe just... Uh, well, I've got a lovely spa bath in mine. I'll put that on. I'll just sit there for an hour and just control my breathing as I'm in the bath. Um, obviously, fitness, you know, getting the blood rushing around the body, going out, doing a bit of fizz, whatever fizz you like. Going for a walk, the best thing you can do is go for a walk and suck some oxygen in, get around some um, get around, get around some natural, some trees, some natural light for you and suck it in, man. Self-care. Self-care is not a dirty word neither. And we we as we as veterans uh, don't do enough of that. You know, look after ourselves, like get some uh, go and put a face pack on, lay, lay in the bath for a bit and control your breathing, mate. I do it all the time. I'm not <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> what it's about. Colin, uh, as always, some great ad advice there for all the veterans there. Um, I would like to thank you for coming on to the Patriot Show and speaking to all the guys and girls who are tuning in as well, mate. We wish you all the best and you have our full support, mate. You're doing some incredible work. You and the team, please keep it up as well. You're making a difference out, out there, Colin. Uh, would you would you like to say anything else at the end of the interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it, if people are struggling, mate, reach out. You know, reach out. Uh, get in the veterans and stuff. You know, do your do your check ins and that. Do your buddy buddy checks. You know, if you think someone is struggling, go and give them a knock. Sometimes, you know, if you give them a call, yeah, 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 I'm okay. If you are worried about someone, just do your double check. You know, and, and encourage them to reach out. Encourage your muckers to reach out. And that that all that funding. All that, all those chat. It's not charity. It's it's our organisations. That money and all those pots are ours for when we need it. All of us. So take it. Takes what's yours and get the help that you need. Okay, reach out if you're struggling. Exactly. I right, call. Um, thank you so much. If you can stay on the line for two minutes, please. To everyone else, thank you for tuning into the Patriot Show. Hopefully that has been well. It has been informative and a bit of an education for the guys and girls out there. If you're struggling, look up the organisations that are out there. There is help out there. Please stay tuned for a couple more minutes, and you'll watch some adverts and trailers from our sponsors and supporters, all veteran-owned companies in the United States and across the United Kingdom as well. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, and stay safe. Catch you on the next show. Thank you.